let's get started. Um, welcome to Retail X Series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sapna Shah. I am the founder of Retail X Series and I'm an angel investor. I invest in the future of retail and consumer at Pre-Seed and now sometimes Seed. Um, that's a little bit of a new thing. Um, but I'm really happy for um, all of you to be here today for this um, for this session where we're going to talk about fundraising, um, we have a great guest, uh, Amanda Herson from Founder Collective, to talk about uh, fundraising from the VC perspective. So we're looking forward to that, but a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, this session is being recorded, so if you have to leave early or you want to go back and review it later, it'll be up in a few days on the RetailX YouTube channel. We will have a moderated discussion for about the first 30 minutes and then we'll have time for audience Q&A. You can put the Q&A in the chat as we go along or once we get there, I'll, I'll remind you to put your questions in the chat. Um, and then last but not least, there will be one more Retail X event before we kind of go on hiatus for the summer. That one is on May 19th. And it's a little bit kind of the opposite of what we're doing today. It'll be a session called How I Raise My Seed by Cynthia. And it'll be a moderated discussion with Cynthia Plotch, uh, the founder of Styx, um, who just raised a three point, either four or $5 million seed. And so we'll hear from her um, and how she's done that. So I hope you can make it to that one as well. But without further ado, Amanda, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Really excited to be here today. With a, with a fellow alum and retail geek. Exactly, exactly. Um, we've got a lot in common. So tell us a little bit about um, you, your background, um, kind of what you focus on at Founder Collective, um, you know, just a little bit more to give us some context. Sure. So I say I really grew up in the school of retail and consumer. I grew up um, in a family that we, we, it's a, we are now a fourth generation family business, but really was a trading store in Cape Town, South Africa, at the tip of Africa, where sailors would stop and kind of pick up their goods. And, uh, you know, growing up, the dinner table conversation was like, what should we sell next? What should we put in the window? What should the prices be? Um, my father opened the second store. My, it was a big family argument. My grandfather said, you're going to bankrupt the family and kind of watched my father's entrepreneurial journey of growing this from one store to ultimately um, over 300 stores. I joined him for part of that journey. Um, I left South Africa straight after school, came to the US and, you know, always had that, that I say retail is in my blood and it really is something that is in your blood when you kind of always think from that perspective and spent some time, you know, management strategy consulting, then worked at limited brands and really wanted to understand the consumer from every angle including investing in consumer businesses and spend some time in Highland Capital, investing a little bit later stage in retail and consumer businesses. It was the time of Lululemon and Pinkberry and City Sports and it was a really fun time to be in that space. Learned a lot of really good and really tough lessons as well. And then returned to South Africa after my MBA and actually um, joined the family business and kind of took the business to the next level, really figuring out how do you operationalize a fast growing business? How do you digitize the business? What tools do you need as you scale the business? And then last year was lured back to the US mid pandemic uh, by an incredible team at Founder Collective. I had Noah and Dave and Eric who are my partners here for many years and was looking for, for a new exciting opportunity and to really take my skills from working in all aspects of, of retail and consumer and bring them to investing. That being said, at Founder Collective, we are absolute generalists. We invest in anything. We love the weird and the wonderful. Our only requirement is really that you're at the seed stage. So, you know, we've invested in everything from Uber, Coupon, Trade Desk to uh, some of the favorites now. I don't want to say favorites. They're all our favorite children. But some of the, the weird, more weird and wonderful ones are um, a company called Running Tide, which is, you know, a uh, oyster farming in Maine. And um, we've also done Etro Never, which is in the death tech industry. So, you know, I think what I say is, while consumer and retail runs in my bank, at the end of the day, almost any business that I look at, there is an aspect of 
consumer because ultimately there is an individual making a decision and whether that is in deep tech, whether that's a B2B SaaS, you know, whether it is a consumer business, whether it's in the healthcare industry, at the end of the day, I think the approach I take is who is using this product, how are they using it and what are the personal decisions that they are making? And so hopefully that gives you, I hope I answered all the questions up front there, Sapna, but that, that kind of gives you a, a brief overview of, of my background. Yeah, that was actually perfect. I think I, I, I really appreciate you kind of giving the context because it is rare that we have investors who have also been operators, um, you know, in this space that you get to really kind of go deep and, and they get their kind of thoughts on how they invest. So I'm, I'm very excited to have this conversation. So let's kind of start with fundraising basics. So what do you expect to see from founders as they begin to raise, um, you know, kind of a seed round from a VC like yourself? How should they be prepared? What do you like to see at that stage? Sure. So I think, you know, this is one of those ones where how long is a piece of string? And I think it varies so much. It's very different in this year, which is a particularly busy year in VC. I think ultimately the, the two things that I always look for are what is your story? What is the narrative? And I think it's something that's so, you know, it seems so obvious, but it's something that a lot of founders forget to tell. And, you know, it's why were you born to do this? Why are you doing this now? Why has no one else done this? And often that story is all we need to, you know, we've made investments in free product companies. Uh, we've made investments really early. I think ultimately at the end of the day, you know, as, as Sapna pointed out, we're all founders and operators. So everyone at FC, we've all kind of been on the other side. We really understand how hard it is what founders are doing, that you're, you know, creating something out of nothing. And I think ultimately there are, tons of brilliant ideas out there, but we're really looking for the right person who's actually can execute on that. So really it's around what is your story? And I mean, not just the company story, but actually your story. And then the other thing that I always find particularly helpful and useful is I don't expect always that there is a product. I don't expect that you've done formal research, but I do expect that you've spoken to customers and really thought from your customer's perspective and gone out, you know, in a very ad hoc way, in whatever way you can manage to hustle and, and speak to your customers. So, you know, often there's no revenue, there's no product, but you've, you've gone and you've listened and you've heard and you've understood the pain points. So really those are, and sorry, the, the most important thing that we look for is hustle. And it's a corny word, but it's a real word. Like, what have you done with that thing? And you know, how have you, I think there we go. You know, how have you created, how have you moved forward with very little? And I think that's also something that we, we really, you don't have to have raised money. You don't have to have built out the whole product, but what have you tinkered with? Who have you spoken to? Who have you got on your side? I think those are things that, that we look for in terms of hustle. I think that was really helpful. Um, and I, I kind of want to turn the question around now. So I think sometimes it's hard for founders when they're going out and looking for the right investor. You know, you mentioned that Founder Collective is a, is a generalist kind of, um, has generalist focus. So if there isn't a particular focus on an industry perspective, how should founders look for the right investor? Like, how do they know that you're right for them? That is such a great question and a really tough one. And I say to the, I say really say this to founders often, and I really mean it. Like this is very much a two way street, and it's very much about finding a fit. And there's you know there's something I know you know that, that the we'll we'll get to later. But I think what you've got to remember is that investors have yes they have investment theses, and I think you can always go to their website and take a look at the companies that they've invested in. And, and often they'll, they'll give you a sense of the criteria. We write this size check. We only invest at this stage. We don't do free product. So there are like broad criteria, but, but then I think something particularly in the environment today to think about is who do I want on my side in later rounds? How do those dynamics work? What type of a fund is gonna help you? So almost you know, transporting yourself to series A and saying, what position am I gonna be in at series A? Founder Collective, one of the things we pride ourselves on is being the most founder aligned fund out there. And so what that means is we only invest at the seed stage and then we dilute alongside you. 
So we're not taking a bet at seed and then, you know, series A, you're like, oh, actually we're, we're not that interested in signaling to the rest of the market. You're not our favorite because we will never lead a series A. So I think you've also got to be careful of, you know, is this a company that's going to be backing you at series A or are they going to kind of, you know, duck around and then people are going to wonder, well, why are they not leading my series A? And I think sometimes, you know, with very, very large funds, you also want to make sure, are you getting the attention of the right partner? Are you significant to that fund? What proportion of their total fund are you? And most importantly, despite, you know, the name brand of the fund or all of those things, do you connect with this particular partner? Because I think at the end of the day, it all comes back to relationships. Is that person going to fight for you? Is that person going to do introductions for you when you're, you know, running out of runway and urgently need to raise money, are they still going to believe in you and are they still going to back you? So I think, you know, I would just say there's a lot of money out there at the moment. I know it's not always easy to get and I recognize that, but really try to find the right money whenever possible. Hope yeah, that I think that's really good advice. I think, I think um, many times I think, we forget that, that these are long-term relationships and this shouldn't be a transactional um, moment um, exactly. in your early stage fundraising. Those people are gonna be on your cap table for quite a while. It's, it's uh, you know, a 10 year marriage and at least. So a lot of people hate the analogy to marriage, but you know, it, it is, you're, you're stuck with these people for a while. So you've got to make sure that you really like them, trust them. And also I think most importantly, going back to economics, that your interests are truly aligned in terms of how important you are to them and how important they are to you. Yeah. And, and so at Seed and, and for you specifically, um, you know, are, are you always looking, should a Seed round always have a lead, first of all? And should you always go as a founder and find that lead first before you start, um, you know, trying to circle the wagons for the rest of the round? Look, I think it's a really tough one for founders there because look, in an ideal situation, is it great if someone's leading around out of the gate? Yes, of course it is. But that doesn't always happen. I don't think it's necessarily, you know, a terrible thing if you don't have a clear lead. I think it is a preference for some funds. The one piece of advice I'd say here is don't don't shop your your deck or your company too too early because I think a lot of this is actually around timing and the VC community you know it is it is a smallish community it is obviously growing incredibly rapidly but I think you also want to make sure that you're not out there too early so that 50 VCs have seen you and then by the time you're actually ready to raise they're like oh yes I saw that company they were too early they hadn't figured out this they didn't have this so I think, you know, prove as much as you can without capital before going out. There are others out there who will say to you, now is a great time to raise. So just get out there, even if you've just got an idea. I tend to be more conservative there. And I say, push yourself as far as you can without capital. Try and prove as much as you can. And then really use that capital as like the gas to grow what you know is going to work and to accelerate that. And, you know, yes, okay, a, a, a lot of people say, well, a meeting with the VC, it's harmless, but you're in the system. People know, oh, you've actually been raising for six months and haven't been funded yet. Or, you know, I'm not sure if I, so I would say try and keep your timeline tighter. Um, I don't, there are a lot of funds that just don't lead and they're fantastic funds. I wouldn't say no to a fund if they were an excellent fund who was going to support me. And, you know, they weren't leading. There are just some funds who are structured like that. Uh, but, you know, when possible, it's great to get a lead early on. So how long do you think the process should take kind of from start to finish? Like, how should founders think about that? I know, I listen, I know raises that have lasted over a year, have paused, have restarted. I know people have stopped raising and then gone to do a program, like an accelerator or something, and then come back to raise. But let's assume that you don't have all the stops and starts. You know, how long should it take? Look, at the end of the day, I think most of you are in this not to raise money, but to actually build your business and run your business. So I think, you know, obviously keeping it as tight as possible is preferable. I think targeting like, you know, an eight to 12 week is, is probably best, best case scenario. 
I think it's rare that it always runs that smoothly. Um, you know, I would also say don't rush it, especially in this environment. The ball can be in your court. And sometimes you want to make sure that you're not just taking the first investors, but you're getting the best investors. So I think try be a little strategic about these are the funds I really want to get to. How can I figure out how to get to them? And you know, as uh, you know, as as many of you know, there are just there are twists and turns on this road. It is rarely a straight line. It is rarely smooth. And there are unbelievable companies who were out fundraising for a year. And you know, there are companies that we've looked at, and then they come back to us six months later, and we're like, "Wow, you've really impressed us!" Like, we're going to take another look here. So you know, go as fast as possible, but also don't beat yourself up if it doesn't happen in eight, 12 weeks, but you know, where, where possible, try to do that just so you can actually continue building versus spending all your time on Zoom talking to VCs, which I know is incredibly hard, incredibly time consuming and forces you to kind of, you know, actually build and, and run your business in your sleep. So that, yeah, that would, that would be my advice there. Be as fast as possible, but also just kind of you know, take the punches and, and the, the re the reroutes as they happen. Yeah, I think that's good advice. So let's say we've gotten, I'm a founder, I've gotten, you know, gotten through kind of the first meeting with you. Um, you're interested, it's time to kind of start diligence. What kind of diligence do you do? Um, you know, given that uh, you mentioned, you know, you can invest even pre-product or pre-revenue. So what really is the diligence process that you would go through with founders? You know, we talk about this a lot internally and it, it literally, there is no copy paste here. It is, fundament it is fundamentally different for each and every company. I think, you know, obviously we want to, to the extent possible diligence, you as a founder understand your background, you know, evidence of, of action in, in your past, how you've worked with other people. Um, if, you know, when possible, there will be back channeling there, you know, if there, there are connections. Um, some of our founders offer up references and say, please speak to these people who I've worked with. So I think having strong references in your past is incredibly helpful. And, you know, really your, your background and how you got to this point is really the best due diligence and evidence of hustle, you know, that you, you've done stuff, you've been successful in roles, you haven't taken a back seat, you've pushed, you've created. I think really that is often the best due diligence we can do. Um, diligence with, cu with customers or potential customers is incredibly helpful. You are selling a product to X. I want to go speak to X and find out if they really want this product. So, you know, if you've got existing customers, I definitely want to speak to those customers. If you don't, but you're growing up a particular industry, I'm going to call up some contacts in that space. I was actually doing, that's where I spent my morning doing this morning. And really, you know, speaking to people in that space, understanding the industry insider perspective of how they think about this product. Why hasn't anyone else succeeded here? What are the hurdles? What budget is this coming out of? Uh, what are your pain points? You're solving for this. Is this really an issue? So I think, you know, that's something. And then obviously we're going to take a look at competitors in the space and understand who else is in the space. How have they done? You know, how much money have they raised? Sometimes that's relevant. Sometimes it's not. What are the competitive dynamics in that space? So I think, you know, individual, customer, and then competitive environment you're going into are generally the three buckets. Um, and then obviously also just the economics of it and like, mm -hmm. Does math work? Like, is there enough margin in here? What is your CAC? What is your LTV? A lot of founders spend a lot of time on TAM. Personally, it's not something I focus on a huge amount. Sometimes it's relevant. Often it's not. In the case where it's a question of, is this really big enough? Might want to spend some time there, but I, I don't see it as the be all and the end all. You mentioned um, kind of the unit economics and CAC and LTV. I think one of the one of the I don't want to say controversial, but semi-controversial things that um, you know I've when talking to other investors um, in these retail X sessions has been: Does a financial model matter to you at this stage? Really, very little. I mean, I go back to my like um, I am a reformed consultant. We can talk about this, you know, so I, it's really, 
envelope math is important to me. Like, okay, so roughly we're going to have this much margin. The market's roughly this size. Honestly, like if you have some traction, yes, do I want to see your, your, you know, financial model? Yes. Great. But if you're pre-product, the financial model, I've built them on the other side and I know that it's generally, you know, not to, not, not to dismiss there, but I know that there's very little, little to, to back that up. So really it's understanding on a macro level, the, the economics versus like, you know, if you have three versus five customers, who knows, no one really knows, but do the overall economics work? So I think, you know, spending hours and hours in Excel trying to some stuck numbers to put in there, not as helpful as a more, and this goes back to telling the narrative. What is, what is the story of the financials? Not what are the actual, like, you know, 5.333, but like, what is the story of, of the financials? Like, why is this market big enough? Why am I going to capture more margin here? Why are competitors not going to undercut me? Why is my CAC going to go down over time? So I think the narrative around those numbers is more important than the model that you, you've built. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that about the narrative and numbers because what I always tell founders is that it's um, your, the, your financial model is essentially your deck, but in numbers. Right. Yeah. It's just kind of backing up with numbers what you're all those things that you told the, the story that you told me in the deck. Um, all your assumptions sort of behind yeah. how you're successful. Exactly. And I think that's the bottom line is their assumptions. So, you know, how they're not backed. And I think both sides of the table know that and almost acknowledge that and say, these this is what I've assumed, and this is why I believe this is gonna work. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so let's talk about, um, I, I wanna kind of skip a little bit to the sort of current environment. So you alluded to the fact that there's a lot of money out there right now um, and that there are kind of, uh, that you should be looking for investors who sort of are aligned, right? Because there's so much money and it's been a busy time in VC, I think you also said. Um, so what's sort of happening right now just in terms of, a couple things, companies and kind of products that are really interesting right now, particularly just given this last year or so that we've been in, and then what's sort of happening in terms of valuations and round sizes. Uh, look, I also want to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, I said, yes, there's a lot of money out there. That being said, I know there are a lot of incredibly talented, amazing founders out there who are still struggling to raise. So I realize that that can almost be a, a hurtful statement. And I want to also acknowledge that it's not like there's money flowing from, you know, the ceilings, and it's still incredibly hard for many brilliant founders to find funding. Um, and so I think, you know, in terms of what's exciting right now, from, from our perspective, being industry agnostic, I, we tend not to invest around themes. There are a lot of themes now around remote work, remote healthcare. There's a lot happening in, in women's health. Um, you know, I, there's a lot happening around obviously e-commerce, which is, you know, something I have a background in, but really at Founder Collective, we are truly industry agnostic and we truly love the weird and wonderful. So I almost prefer to look in areas that not everyone is necessarily as focused on because I feel like there, you're just going into a really competitive space and there are 15 startups you're going to be competing against versus if you go to a more unloved area where there might be fewer people focused on that. So I think you know, we're looking for founders focused on a real problem that they are insanely passionate about and they are uniquely positioned to solve. And I really keep on going back to that. Like what excites me when a founder is born to do this? I call, you know, like I just, I am, a, I just love founder market fit. It's something that I fall for. It's something I'm incredibly passionate about. And when I listen to a founder and I'm like, you were born to do this. You're going to figure this out. Not that every founder out there is going to have perfect founder market fit. And there are many founders who have no, you know, absolutely zero relation to the business that they're building, but they just, you know, see an opportunity. Um, but ultimately I want to know why you're going to build this. And I think, you know, there are themes out there, but I don't think you need to be in the theme to be funded. Yeah, that's good. That's that's good to hear. So, um, so what do you see happening in terms of the valuations and round sizes, particularly at Seed, which I think has really changed over the last couple of years? 
Look, I think um, round sizes are getting a lot bigger. <laughs> you know, I think um, companies that we would have called pre-seed who are at the stage of pre-seed are raising seed rounds. I think we're seeing a lot of that. So like there's very little evidence. There is no product market fit and they're raising 3 million plus. So, you know, I think they're, we're seeing a move there. And then obviously like, Series A is happening really fast, very close, very close to kind of when seed is happening. So, you know, rounds are getting bigger, rounds are closer together. There are also companies who like raise pre-seed a couple of months and are now raising their seeds. I just think founders are spending a lot of time fundraising. Uh, it's moving fast, the rounds are bigger, the valuations are tending to be bigger. Um, not always the case. And, you know, I think it's also just, being careful about not getting swept up in that hype. You know, advice I would give here is just think towards do your next round. And, you know, in this case, think towards your series A. If you've raised your seed at this valuation, what valuation is your series A going to need to be at? And what are the milestones you're going to need to prove by then? Because I think, you know, getting ahead of your skis is a concern here. Oh, I just got an amazing valuation for my pre-seed. You know, you run out of money in your pre-seed, you go raise your seed and people are like, I'm not going to give you a valuation bigger than, than that because you haven't proved out anything yet. So I think, you know, highest valuation is not always the best outcome for the founder and being, being aware of that is important advice in this type of environment. And people hate hearing that. Um, one of my, my, my partner, Mike, said it's like, it's like telling a founder to, to, to like eat spinach. It's not something that you necessarily want to do. Um, but I think it's an important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that piece about milestones because I think you do see a lot of founders who'll say things like, well, this round will get me 12 months of runway, but they're not necessarily thinking what milestone will I be hitting at the end of that 12 months or preferably before that 12 months so you don't run out of money before you hit a milestone. So I, I, I appreciate that you, you uh, mentioned that as well. Um, so, okay, we're still in this Zoom world, which I really thought we would be out of at this point. But, you know, now that kind of we've been here for, I don't know, 14, 15 months, I don't even know how long, you know, do you have any kind of tips for how do you build those relationships? Like, how do you see as a VC, how do you over Zoom, how are you getting that passion, that founder uh founder market fit that this person was born to do this startup like how are you how are you getting that what are tips that you can give to founders to really be able to portray that over like a zoom call yeah i, I mean i think it's it's so tough and i think not all but many of us would much prefer to be in person and connecting and having those coffee chats and um really getting to know people and not just having these transactional zoom calls i think you know advice i'd give here is just when you are meeting with a with a vc try and ensure that it's not a monologue and you know i've sat and i've sat in on pictures where it's like the founder just wants to like kind of get through everything and it's a one-way conversation at the end i'm like what you know like what was that like i don't actually feel like i know anything about the founder i didn't so really ensuring that it's a two-way conversation that you're also engaging with the vc Yes, it's small chit chat about where are you, what's the weather, but sometimes uncovering those personal human facts about someone are what really stand out. And I'm sorry, I sound like an absolute broken record, but I'm going to go back to the tell your story. Don't just don't just pitch your company, because I think telling your story makes it a person that you remember versus you know another pitch amongst. And and I think the other unfortunate thing in this environment is that VCs are just and consuming way more pictures per day. And you really want to make sure that there's some connection with you. I also find sometimes like follow-up emails are really helpful. Oh, you know, you asked me about this. I thought about it more deeply. Here's my response. Or I know you wanted to see that. I've done a Loom video. Let me show it to you. I find those follow-ups from founders incredibly helpful because often it's like, you know, you sat through so many pictures and then you're trying to remember what are, what are the pieces that stood out? Oh, I really wish I had more time to ask about that. So I think, you know, just in any way you can be more personable, 
you know, even I hate to say this because it sounds so formulaic, but have read up about if you can, if you've had the time, you know, read up about the investor, see if there's something interesting that they've said or a particular connection. Those little things just make it more human at the end of the day versus just like Zoom, you know, <laughs> Zoom to Zoom, it, it can become more person to person. And yeah. I think, you know, we like in the city now, I'm trying to where possible do a walk with the founder. It's a difficult to transition back to that because our calendars are so overscheduled from Zoom. But I think where that is, is possible, um, do that. I, I'm sorry, I know I wasn't meant to, but I spied a question and I'm gonna, it, it links into this and to say, yeah. I did say, you know, oh, well, don't reach out to, to VCs too early. What I meant there is like, don't just share your deck too early. I think to the extent that you can network with VCs, which is much harder in this world, I think that's great and that's always a good idea. And I love hearing from founders before they've actually officially gone out to raise. I was referring more there. Once you decide you're going out to raise, make sure you get the timing of that raise more, more accurate. Yeah, that's actually a really great segue. Let's let's move to um, actually the questions in the chat. And so if anybody, I have more questions, obviously, but um, but I want to make sure that we get to everybody in the audience's questions. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. I will read them out um, just so that we have them on the recording. Um, let's start with this first one from David. You always hear that VCs invest in lines, not dots. Are you recommending that founders hold off on investor outreach until they're ready to raise around that really knowing an investor for a long time is not as important anymore as it might have been in the past? It's an excellent, excellent question. I'm really excited to pick up on that one. David, I think, you know, it's a great point. I think there's a difference between pitching your company and getting to know a VC. So I think, you know, if you happen to be able to build a long-term connection, absolutely. Like, is it much easier to invest in someone where you've seen their tra trajectory and knowing them for, you know, months or years? Absolutely. What I would be cautious of is emailing my deck out to, 50 VCs before I fully baked my idea. Because I think, you know, you then in the system, it's like, oh, I'm not interested in that company. You come back three months later when you're actually ready, but you might not get that foot in the door again. So I think building relationships, always, always preferable. Um, it's, it's much easier, you know, when you know someone and you know something about someone. Um, but I think the more transactional you know, sharing decks, I think just be cautious of that before you're ready. Yeah. I, and I think it used to be so much easier to, you know, you'd go to pitch competitions, you'd go to events and you'd be able to meet people exactly. without having to talk about a deck and you could just talk about your story. And those places are not available right now. So it is, they will, a, come, back. They will come back. They will come back. Hopefully I, I hear July 1st, everything's opening in New York on July 1st. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Um, anyway, um, I think Charles has a question for this entire group, so people can chat back uh, with him about investors in SaaS products. Um, Nicole asks, where do you source your deals and what do you recommend to founders that don't have warm intros? That's a really good question, Nicole. And I think, you know, there's an assumption that, oh, everyone can get a warm intro. And I recognize that that really isn't the case. I think, you know, we get inbound from, Twitter, I would say Twitter over LinkedIn, to be honest, just because LinkedIn has become unmanageable. And I apologize to anyone out there if I haven't responded, <laughs> but it's a bit overwhelming to keep up there. But I think, you know, comment on a Twitter post. If, if you see, you know, if you see something that's interesting, in, engage with the VC. Not all VCs will respond, some will. Um, you know, I think we have a cold inbound. All, all the deals get, you know, reviewed. I can't say that every deal will, not, that will meet with every single deal that comes in there, but we absolutely will review it. And then I think to the extent that there are office hours or there are accelerators, I think they're incredibly helpful to get you into the community and to improve networking. So I would say, you know, follow VCs you're interested in on Twitter, see if there's something that they are, you know, interested in that coincides with what you're building um, and, and just be opportunistic. And also your founder network is incredibly valuable. So I think build your founder network, use your founder network. You know, sometimes a founder will meet with a VC and it won't be a match for them, but they'll say, actually, I've got a friend who's building in this space, you should meet with them. So I think also leverage 
that network to the extent that you can. Yeah, that's great advice. Okay, moving on to Roberta's question. Uh, oh, that's not a question, that was a comment. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure what this question means from Zane. Are there any tips of IP strategies and market choice for the founders? I'm not sure what that means, Zane. I'm not sure if I understand that one. Okay. Any, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, in the meanwhile, oh, here we go. From Nicole, what factors do you take into account for assessing valuation? No, that's a great question and a very difficult one. Um, I think often there it really is like, what milestones have you achieved? Do you have product market fit? Do you have any traction? Where are you in that pre-seed to seed? You, you know, uh, like where are you on that scale? Are you really pre-seed? Have you proven it out? Se second time founders generally tend to attract a slightly higher valuation. You know, often they've, they've proven themselves out and they're coming back to the market. So there is also that element. Are you a first time founder? Are you a second time founder? What industry are you building in? You know, is it consumer or SaaS? Those are also things that, that come into it. Um, you know, on a, on a company where there might be limited upside, there will be more conservative valuations. On a company where there's unlimited upside, you might see higher valuations. So, you know, I don't, I, I wish I could give you like more, ta I realize I'm not giving you very tangible feedback here. Um, but I think going back to a point I said earlier, being able to prove out as much as you can without capital helps you to get to a higher valuation. Because, you know, if you've gone and done, you know, you've got one design customer on board, or you've got feedback from, 50 people or you've got a demo those are all things that really help an investor to figure out okay where where are you on this on this timeline on this value and it, like valuation is also almost a timeline and also very much what industry you're in i think also you know not too much but that can impact valuation yeah and then how would you relate that to dilution because i think that is the other thing that's sort of the other side of the coin here right that i think a lot of founders maybe don't think about until they kind of get into the round and then they start to see the numbers and and you know it's like a push pull right um on dilution and kind of the valuation that might be right for your company absolutely and you know i think you know at founder collective we don't like founders to get incredibly diluted so you know if your valuation is not massive maybe you shouldn't be raising as much so sometimes raising less on a smaller valuation can help push you further and prevent dilution so i think you've got to also think through those dynamics and going back to reiterate a point i said earlier where do you want to be for the next round how much are you going to need to raise what are the milestones there and what type of dilution are you going to take in that round so, you know, there, we love companies that don't need to go out and keep raising because the founder gets less diluted and, you know, no one really wants to back a founder who hardly owns their company. We want you to own your company. We want you to have a great outcome. You know, you're giving your blood, sweat and tears for this. Um, you've got so much, we want you to have skin in the game. So I think, you know, there, there, is a, there are a lot of elements that go into that valuation and and then how much are you raising so obviously at a higher valuation you can raise a bit more and get less diluted at a lower valuation you might not want to raise as much because you're going to be giving up a big chunk of your company so hopefully that helped answer that that was great thank you um and then how do you help your this is also from nicole how do you help your portfolio companies other than through funding absolutely so i think you know this depends again if we're a lead investor or an angel investor we invest in both those ways. And it really depends, you know, what, what's happening in the round, what the founder is looking for. I think really, um, my partner, Eric, we have a great analogy here is, you know, we want to be your, your favorite uncle. We're there when you need us, but we're not going to tell you how to run your business. And I think really for me, uh, founder collective, where we really try to help any introductions we can do, we will always reach out to our net, network. We have you know, an incredible network um, on the East Coast and across the US. We like to really help our founders thinking through their fundraising. We, we have the same interests as you because we're not looking to lead the round. So we're going to try and help you think through how much should I raise? When should I raise? Who should I go to? Can I get an introduction to them? 
those are areas where we really try and be incredibly helpful. You know, when we can introduce to customers, we'll always assist there. And one of the things I think that is most helpful to our founders is actually being part of our collective and having access to this incredible network of founders who you can bounce things off of, ask questions. We hold a lot of office hours with experts for our founders where they can, you know, speak to some of the leading marketers or leading, you know, CEOs who who built successful companies and ask them questions that they're struggling with. So, you know, are we going to sit with you daily? Probably not. Are we going to tell you how to run your company? No, you are the expert in this. But if you come to us, we're going to help you whenever we possibly can. And I think it comes in so many forms. Another area that we help a lot is with recruiting. I've actually been helping a lot of founders in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, looking for particular roles or founders who are dealing with like strategic issues. They're like, should I go left or right? And really helping them kind of think through that from a macro level. So hopefully that answers the question. Perfect. Thank you. Um, from Kevin, oh, going back to the uh, warm intro. If you don't have a warm intro available for a firm, would you recommend cold outreach? Absolutely. Look, is, is, a, is a warm intro preferable? Yes. Is it always possible? No. Um, so I think, you know, wherever you can, it's helpful to have a warm. But otherwise, we've, we actually invested very recently, I can't mention it yet, but in a company that came in completely cold inbound. And, you know, we picked it up, we thought it was really interesting, we met with the founder, and we just wrote them a check. So there are, you know, Whoop, which is one of our companies came in, you know, in office hours. So, you know, there are so many ways that companies can come in. It doesn't, you do not have to be a friend of the VC. You do not have to know someone who knows someone. You really just have to make sure that your story gets heard, which is harder for cold because not as much time is spent on it. But I think, you know, this founder that came in cold had such a compelling, incredible deck that we were like, wow, this is one of the best decks we've ever seen. And we were like, we should take a meeting here. And we met with him and we we're like, you're even better than your dad. So, you know, I think there, there, are, uh, th there are cases where even with cold, um, you can have a successful outcome. Great. Um, the next question from Angelina is, has the pandemic changed what you look for in companies? Are there factors, KPIs, narratives that you're looking at today that you wouldn't have looked at pre-pandemic? No, other than flexibility. I think, you know, we've seen a lot of founders who have pivoted really brilliantly in the pandemic. There are a lot of companies we looked at before the pandemic that completely pivoted and just did an amazing job. So I think the pandemic has shown us all flexibility. And, you know, obviously there's a little bit more of a bias to uh, telehealth and digital and remote and work from home. Um, but I don't think it's fundamentally changed what we've looked for in our founders. Um, if anything, it's reinforced that, you know, incredible founders are incredibly flexible and are able to adapt and change to the, to the circumstances around them, which are constantly changing. And, you know, seeing some of the founders in our portfolio, I just have so much admiration for them, how they've really, you know, they, they just fought through this for a lot of them the pandemic could have been devastating and they've found a way and i think it's looking for founders who will run through walls um is is what we're going to look for because there have been many walls that they've had to run through during the pandemic yeah for sure i completely agree with you on the flexibility front um the next question is from jim do you have an ownership target that you look for with your initial check no, we don't. We, 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 we really don't. We want to be aligned with the founder and we'll be flexible to the needs of the founder. We have a minimum check size just because we want to ensure that we're meaningful to you and you're meaningful to us, but we don't have um, a minimum target. Okay, great. Um, from Adish, how to, how, to get to, how to get to know if the investor is authentically committed to our mission or purpose besides just having put in capital. Oh, how do you, how do you know if the investor is authentically committed? Thank you for asking a question because it was something that I wanted to mention. And that is, this is a two way street and you should diligence the founder as much as they diligence you. And you should speak to founders in their network and find out what that VC is like to work with. Did they write the check and then did they, you never hear from them again? Uh, did they support you when you were, you know, stuck in a tough time? So I think really there, um, 
you know, knowing that that founder has been there for other founders is the best way to, to, to test out the VC. And you should, we always encourage founders. We're like, we're going to diligence you. You should absolutely diligence us. We can intro you or you can back channel, but you should speak to founders in our network. Yeah, for sure. Uh, from Nicole, and I think you've a little bit talked about this, but what, uh, what do you look for in the founding team? Again, it depends on the company. I look for someone who's going to run through walls, who's got hustle. And look, I think there are times when it's really important to have a strong CTO, or sometimes it's really important to have an industry insider. So in certain industries, like I'm going to be like, well, who on the team really understands how to sell into that space or who on the team, you know, um, understands those intricacies. So sometimes domain expertise is incredibly important, not always, but sometimes. And um, sometimes technical skills are really important. So those are kind of the two things that we'll, we'll often look for. And, you know, and, and sorry, the most important thing is actually chemistry as well. Like, I like to see that founders have worked together before. I like to see that they've got a common interest. I, you know, sometimes when it's like a whole group of founders who've never worked together before, you're like, is this going to work? Is, so definitely chemistry on the team is something that is important. Great, thanks. Okay, from Maya, on average, how much equity should a founder expect to give up in a seed round? Oh, that's a very tough, difficult question that I might shoot back to you, Seven. What are the guidelines? That you, you know, we don't always think, it's, it's a very tough one. It depends if you raise a pre-seed or seed. What would you say you've generally been seeing? I'm gonna throw the question back at you. Do you think, do you, do you give advice to founders there? I mean, I do it at pre-seed because um, typically I wasn't investing at seed until very recently, but um, you know, at pre-seed, I think a lot of founders um, maybe think that they need to give up more because it's so hard to raise at pre-seed. There's a lot fewer funds, you know, angels, pre-product, whatever. And, you know, I kind of say like really at pre-seed do not go over above kind of 20% if you're raising kind of a pre-seed round. I've seen founders at pre-seed give up 35% of their company, but then you get to that problem that you were mentioning before, which is by the time you're at A, you don't own very much of your company at all. Yeah. So I don't, I think this is really hard because I think it's also what the market will bear. This is a bit of a negotiation and it's very dependent on your industry. Yeah. Very dependent on your traction. It's a really tough one, but like, I mean, the you know, like two, one, six or seven, three on nine or you know like nine or two, like those are probably the ranges where, where things are um but it you know it, it it depends it depends what industry you're in how long you've been raising how hard it is to raise um but again they're going back to kind of what i keep on saying think through to the series a what is the cap table going to look like after the series a and literally try and map that out literally map out okay so I'm raising seed. It's going to give me this much runway. What is my cap table going to look like at Series A? And I think the other really important question here is like, how many times are you going to raise? Like, are you going to be profitable after Series A? There are companies that they never go. There are companies that never go past seed. We, you know, we've got companies in our portfolios that raised a seed and they built fantastic companies without needing to raise again. So also how capital efficient is your business? This is an important question to ask you. For some founders, they can get to profitability. They might have to give up more in the seed, but they'll never have to raise again. And sometimes that's a great outcome. So, you know, I think you've got to kind of weigh all those factors and I hate to give up a hard and fast target, but don't give up too much because you're going to struggle in series A when VCs come and see that like, oh, well, you know, how much skin is this founder really going to have in the end? Yeah. And I think the other thing here is that founders should not forget that all those safes and whatever from accelerators or you know friends and family all of those do end up causing dilution as well so really thinking ahead to series a when everything is converting and then you know working your way backwards i think is really critical to know exactly all of what you've given up because i think sometimes it's very unclear and prorata uh, rights you know like you know, often you're really desperate. You take some money from friends and family and they've got parada rights and then you've got another investor you want to get on board, but they also want to put in. So you kind of got to weigh up all those early decisions. It's a great point. You know, they, they can come back to bite you. So just, you know, try and think ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, 
Amanda, because I know you need to go. But um, so the next question is from Mary. Totally curious question. What's the wildest company you've reviewed that you've backed that has really taken off? Oh, we've got so many there. This one's an easy one. Well, I think I mentioned two of them, but the one is um, Oyster Farming, Running Tide, one we're really proud of. Um, and, and, oh, there are some crazy ones that we've done. Um, you know, Etter Never, I also mentioned that one, which is turning human, human ashes into diamond in the death tech space. Really wonderful company creating transparency around and, and really empathy around, um, around that process. So, you know, I think, um, there are a lot of fun, interesting areas that don't sound particularly sexy where amazing businesses have been built. Yeah. Do you have time for one more question? I really like the next uh, one. Cool. Okay. In our financial planning, do we need to show that we hit a hundred million in revenue in year five to show the potential of being a unicorn? If not, what is a good size to be venture fundable? I love yeah. this. It's, it's a great, another, another great question and touches on many things that we've been talking about, which is like, are your incentives aligned with your investors and you know we say there are companies who've had you know incredible outcomes for the founder and 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 for for founder collective that are not unicorns and we've written you should go read on our blog post we've written really interesting articles around this that the answer to that question depends on how much you raised and it goes back to the prior question so you know i think if if you've had a raise uh you know 50 million to to get there probably not the best outcome you know if you've raised 1 million to get there that's an incredible outcome so i think you've got to take it back to how much have you raised how much dilution has there been many of our amazing companies are not unicorns but have had great outcomes for the founder and the vc and i think this notion that every company needs to be a unicorn you know is 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 frustrating because um, there are founders out there building brilliant businesses that will change their lives and change the lives of other people that do not need to be, you know, you do not need to get to 500 million or, you know, so I think just knowing what you want your outcome to be, understanding your dilution and knowing that you've picked the right investor because there are investors who will say, this isn't going to be a unicorn. I'm not going to do the series A. Good luck to you. And, you know, there are others who will understand what you're building, where you want to exit. You know, maybe you're building this for a strategic or you're building this for a different outcome. So, you know, making sure incentives are aligned there is, is hugely important. Yeah, I, I, I ditto. Couldn't agree more. Amanda, thank you so much. This was wonderful. I think your advice, all your tips were so helpful. Really appreciate you coming on um, Retail X Series. Thanks. It's been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for the great questions. And, you know, I, I know that there are so many incredible people on this call doing amazing things. And I think just, you know, just remember that at the end of the day, it's a one-to-one -one personal relationship. Don't get beat up by rejection. It's like dating. You just need one person at the end of the day. And um, it's not easy and it's tough. And I think, you know, just don't take it personally when there are VCs that aren't a match because it is so much around just personal tastes and preferences. And it's no reflection on you or what you're building when a VC says no. And I think I just want to kind of reinforce that to founders who deal with so many no's and so much rejection. You just need that one yes. And there are amazing companies out there that face tons of no's. So um, just keep building and um, keep believing in yourself. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you all to everyone uh, who joined. Um, I hope to see you May 19th for the last Retail X series before we go on summer hiatus. You will also get an email about it and you will also get an email about the recording of this session. And if you aren't already, you'll get an invitation to the, uh, to the Retail X Slack group as well. Um, thank you all and we'll see you next time. Bye. Yes.